Now what we'll do is just have this off to the side, right. and that way you can see it in case you get any questions. Okay. Which one is it? So here's what we'll do. You tell me where you want this. Um, can I use the pop-up? It does. It will, you can do it that way, too. It won't pop up like this, but a little bubble will pop up. Uh, Are you familiar with how this interface at all with uh, GoToMeeting? Uh, okay. Well, I'll just give you a very, very easy, quick tutorial. See this little arrow? Right. If you see a bubble come up, if you just click that little arrow, okay. it comes up. Okay. Okay. See, there's chat, right. and it'll show up. And then just to put it back down, okay. same little arrows. And then, and that way you can just see a little bubble will come up and say there's a chat or somebody asking right. something, and then you simply just you can pull this up and go, oh, this is what they're saying, okay. and then you can answer them okay. from there. Make sense? Sure. Okay. And if you hear a voice from beyond, it's just them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yep. Just like in a classroom, there's, uh, you know, somebody's going to chime in. There's a slight delay, though, so you may start, you may say any questions. Okay, no, and then they'll say something, you know, so, <laughs> anyway. We'll go with this one. Yeah. Flaps at the Southern Speaks. Yes. There you go. Yes. There you go. <laughs> Are there any? Yes. Yeah, exactly. yes. Um, this is also, if you would like it, uh, well, it's not it's plugged in. That's all right. I'll just use this. It's okay. Like just... <laughs> is it out of batteries? No, I'm betting it's dead. Yeah. You, do you want me? I can get a battery and check it. No. You sure? All right, I'm going to leave it for tomorrow then and I'll check it. Remember not to wander off. Right? <laughs> <laughs> All that set, that's all. Okay, you're good. All right, good deal. Thank you, sir. Enjoy. Do you want something to drink or eat or something? You know, I may go in there when the group comes in. Okay. Have a little something.
Jason, how are you?
The other thing would be is if you did two, is there some component where you have to do it summer? I mean, I don't think you want to lose the momentum. Right. Or, okay, I've got time to right. break. I'm just trying to think if there's a way to cross them off or similar to what we do with our cohorts. Right. We're going to let it start, so grab something quick, Ellen. <laughs> that are joining us remotely. Uh, I want to welcome Dr. David Rogers. Uh, Dr. Rogers is the Senior Associate Dean of Faculty Affairs and Professional Development in the School of Medicine. So he's been involved in two research programs that were focused on interpersonal conflict that occurs in two specific types of teams found in an academic medical center. He speaks frequently to groups on the topic of team conflict management and he also is a co-leader of the Healthcare Leadership Academy. Uh, Take it away. Hey, try. So let me get a sense of who you are before I start. Some of you I know, some of you I don't. So Don, let's start with you. So I'm Don Joy Peterson. I work for the Office of Interprofessional Simulation as their director of faculty development and training, and I'm also a faculty appointment in the School of Medicine Department of Education. I'm Elise Simply, I'm a farm D, a VA quality scholar. I'm actually the first VA quality scholar who's a born and decent hired to be here. Yes, I'm Carrie White. I'm on the faculty at the School of Public Health. I'm Ellen Eaton. I'm in the Division of Infectious Diseases. Great. I'm Kevin Riggs. I'm an internist in preventive medicine. Okay. Right now, uh, administrator for, for the training academy. Jane Lambert. I'm with the CCT and Okay. Well, thank you for that. And for those of you who are joining us uh, via social media, I'm informed the webcam isn't working, so uh, we apologize you can't see us all. We are informed we can hear you, so if you drift off, we will hear the sound of your head hitting your desk. I guess. <laughs> So one of the things that's interesting is that increasingly we all do our work in teams. And so in contemplating uh, what I could do to bring you some uh, beneficial information about research teams, you know, one of the things that's in current conversation is this idea of being a team scientist. And I think that just recognizes that the nature of the problems that we're trying to manage uh, in science have become it's kind of like the Lord of the Rings team that I featured on this slide, that the, the nature of the problems are just too great for an individual to try to solve anymore. Um, and this is certainly true in healthcare as well. We don't ever do anything by ourselves. And so increasingly, uh, we do everything in teams. So uh, Ryan gave you a little the blurb that I provided him, but I just wanted to kind of give you my uh, interest in uh, team conflict because it's I've been interested for quite a while. Um, I do a fair amount of faculty development about it. It's a kind of a big topic. Uh, so I take pieces of it uh, to try to deliver to the particular interests of that group. 
Uh, but this is kind of my journey. And it, my program of research was about how surgeons manage uh, conflict in operating room teams. And that uh, is a very interesting kind of team. Uh, for a lot of people who aren't in surgery, it's scary for me to tell you many of the details. Uh, but suffice it to say, in many really important ways, that team doesn't really fulfill the full definition of what a team is and does. Uh, it's just like we use the term code team in the hospital for people who are in great distress uh, or in some cases newly deceased. Uh, and the truth is those people who rush to aid that person don't even know each other in many cases. They certainly don't know each other's capabilities. So my interest, my research program was really around this very unique kind of team. And there are some important things that we learned about it. But relevant to this is one of the things we learned is really effective conflict management is really just effective leadership maintained through a particular circumstance. Beyond that, however, I think it's really a test of your true leadership. Anybody can manage a team when everything's harmonious and there's plenty of resources and things are going along well and all the personalities are melding and those are joyful things and if that's the nature of your current life, you should celebrate it. Uh, because it doesn't usually last very long. Uh, and so it really is, what do you do in a crisis or when a strong conflict develops? Can you maintain your leadership uh, capability? And I would argue this is why we seem to have a, a healthy interest in wartime leaders. If you think about it, if you go down to the bookstore, go quickly before they all close, replaced by Amazon, uh, and you look at leadership, a lot of leadership stuff is written by retired generals or other people, or we study military leaders and that sort of thing. And I think it's because we recognize that when you're in a situation where there's a group of people trying to, to kill you and you can maintain your equanimity, that that's something that's kind of special. Uh, it was particularly true in the Civil War, you know, when the generals many times were out actually in the middle of conflict. So. Uh, but this is really, to me, a big lesson that the first time your team comes into conflict, if you can keep your wits about you and actually navigate it through, uh, you'll be, begin to develop credibility as a leader. <laughs> this was my thesis. It's unpublished. You can find a copy of it at the University of Illinois Chicago Library. That's the only place you'll be able to read it because, as I mentioned, it's unpublished for a number of important reasons. But I was interested in learning groups because I was involved in a residential program where people that were used to being in charge were all thrown together to work in groups. And so I became very interested in that, and that was the basis for my thesis. And basically, it was a descriptive study to look at, like, what are people's perceptions around conflict in that kind of group. I also have a copy in of my office. If you're deeply interested, I'll share it with you. I, but I guess really my interest in conflict goes back to some of my first uh, periods of conscious awareness as a human, uh, and that this is my family crest for the Rogers family. You'll see it's three rams, uh, and so it's a warrior class of people. The name roughly translated, translated means uh, beloved spear holders. So that's what the Rogers are. We're warriors that fought in a lot of wars. Uh, and, our, uh, and our reputation as a family coming over from Ireland and Scotland was that we're excellent singers, which is true, uh, and excellent storytellers, which is also true, but with a propensity for violence. Uh, and so I've been around my father's family is a large family, and I've been observing us cause conflict, and if I'm honest, I have a propensity to cause it myself. So part of my motivation to share with you my tips for managing it effectively is I certainly have caused a reasonable amount of it. So sometimes with the best of intentions. But some of the principles I'm going to share with you today actually apply not only to your research teams, but to your other working teams but even to your family units. So some of the principles are designed around these stable teams. Uh, there are interesting differences between those and SWIFT teams. So my background is as an educator, so I like to publish these to make a covenant with you. This is the information 
that I'm going to try to, to give to you. If at any point you have questions uh, as I kind of deliver my remarks, I would welcome them. If I need to make clarifying comments, if I say things that are ridiculous or confusing, you can just raise your hand. Um, and we'll try to leave time at the end for conversations as well. <laughs> So it's interesting, as it turns out, people who do research about conflict are in fact in conflict about what it actually is. And so they will get together at meetings where they talk about these things and they will disagree about what is actually conflict. I like this particular definition in that it captures to me the sense, the emotional sense that you have when you come into conflict in the team or when your team gets into conflict. And that's it's a social interaction. So there actually is a type of conflict that doesn't involve other people. That's called intrapersonal conflict. And that an example of that is role conflict. So many of us are, we have significant others or we're parents and we're professionals and we are constantly managing conflict around my role. Um, and that's interesting, but not the purpose of today's uh, conversation. So a social interaction, it escalates up between two people to factions within groups uh, to, to outright warfare can be regarded as a type of team conflict. It involves a struggle uh, over claims to resource, resources, power, status, beliefs, and other preferences or desires. And what I like about this is I think when I got newly involved in conflict, it's typically around in our environment resources or about uh, ideas, because that's the nature of what we do. But it quickly gets into this emotional and political sort of frame. And I think if you're new to like causing or solving conflict, it sometimes is unsettling how quickly that can happen. So for example, I was talking to Tika Benvenestes, who's one of my senior associate dean colleagues, and she's trying to do kind of an effort around how we use research space. And we were having the conversation. This is a completely rational conversation to have because we're recruiting researchers. We have researchers. We have a lot of space, but we don't have a lot of good quality space. We don't know how the space is being used. So this is one of these kind of ultra rational conversations. But you quickly get into a highly emotional space because for research faculty, space is essential for their effort. And it has to do with prestige and it has to do with being respected. And so you will go and pose a completely rational question about how are you using your space? And a person goes crazy bonkers. And it's because you didn't realize I'm now over into this thing about beliefs and status and those kind of things. And that's one of the reasons why I like this particular definition, because it reminds me it gets emotional and value driven very quickly. In fact, you can think of a lot of the stuff that's going on in the Middle East as being a value-based conflict. And value-based conflict is extremely difficult to resolve, right, because these are strongly held beliefs. So an academic medical center is the perfect place to study conflict, because if you think about it, we take highly passionate people who are wildly intelligent by any measure uh, that we would care to contemplate. We have them work on ideas about which they have great passion, and we chronically under-resource it, right? So that, that's like how war starts. That is how to generate conflict. And so that's why this topic is important and this opportunity is important, because it, it will occur. So the way that I like to think of it, I've been married a little over 30 years, and so, um, and I don't have much conflict with my spouse now, because after the first decade, you've sort of negotiated out the major things. And then we had two sons, so we've got so exhausted from that, we just don't have it the what it takes. It's like, whatever. Uh, but conflict, I like to think of it as a dance. And that is, it, it typically, for most rational people, there's a source or a cause. There are a few people that are inclined just to go around and provoke other people. Fortunately, they're kind of the minority. Uh, they exist. You know some of them, I know some of them, but it's unusual. And then it actually goes through a sequence of responses, and then finally there are outcomes. So I kind of want to walk you through the dance, because you can be active in every part of this. 
I like to think of it, um, and I just went and saw my optometrist yesterday, I like to think of all conflict as, as, as sort of being two lenses. And, that, and this is how I think about it. When I begin to hear language that sounds conflictual, then I begin to think of it. So there's task conflict and there's relationship conflict. Now, Lindred Greer, who is the lead author of this paper, who's at Stanford Business School, she would argue this point, and she is a conflict researcher. And so she also talks about process conflict as though it's different, and she's now expanding this idea of relationship conflict. At least for me, it's helpful to think about the two lenses, and that is the task and the relationship. And so just kind of, if you will, hang on to that frame, recognizing it's probably a very simplistic uh, sort of distillation of a large body of work. But because I wear glasses, it's particularly helpful for me to think about two lenses. So this is what task-related conflict is. And again, Dr. Greer would argue that there's two types. I would argue that there's two variants of task-related conflict. So what she talks about is that task-related conflict is disagreement among team members about the content and outcomes of the task being performed. So if we take a non-scientific uh, example, let's say that we all determined that we would go out and eat together this evening. And so we would engage on the thing, well, what kind of food do you want to get? Do you want to get Thai? Do you want to get barbecue? If it's barbecue in Birmingham, it's what kind of barbecue? So we would have that kind of conversation in a research setting, it would be like, what, what is the phenomenon of interest? What are we talking about? Are we interested in this thing? How are we going to do this? So it would, can be a scientific inquiry. And it's something that tip, people typically tolerate reasonably well. Process conflict is more about the logistical aspects of it. So to go back to our dinner analogy, let's say we've decided that we're going to have uh, Nick and Jim's. And so now we said, how are we going to get there? You know, who's going to arrange transportation? So we have the outcome in mind, but then we have to decide these sort of logistical things that need to be done. In a research project phase, this might be, well, who's going to do the literature review? And who's going to write the proposal, right? So it's all sort of little red hen stuff, if you remember that childhood story. You know, who's going to, who's going to thresh the wheat? Who's going to grind the, you know, it's that kind of task assignment that happens. <clears throat> Relationship-related conflict it is is uh, a woman named Karen Jen, who's now in Australia, actually. Uh, she was at Wharton Business School, then went to the Netherlands, and now is in Australia. But she has been kind of <clears throat> drawing attention to this aspect of conflict. How she defines it is disagreement about personal issues outside the task. I take a slightly different view is I just think it's a, it's kind of a, it's a, what some people would call interpersonal conflict. So it's conflict related to your personhood, attributes related to you. And it can be something as silly as your sense of humor, right? Like you, you think it's funny to talk about this, and I don't think that's funny at all. Right, so that's just a personal thing. And so it can be little things, sort of seemingly trivial things. It can be how certain people talk. It can be those sort of little things that can be about this relationship conflict. The big thing, and one of the big take home lessons is, is it has a horrible negative impact on your group's activities. So by most measurable outcomes, it causes this extreme negative, negative process problems, depletes negative energy that could have been expended toward task completion. So usually when I meet with a group of people like this, y'all are all, you know, intelligent, educated people, and you'll say, I don't have any of that. So here's the test, if that's your frame of mind, is imagine that your immediate supervisor comes and says, I want, to, I want you to do this project, and you're like, that sounds like a great project. I'd love to do it. And let's say it's like, we'll make it Disney World. Here's actually some resources I'm going to give you to do it. So now you're super excited. And then they say, but I've already put together the team. And they start going through a list. And imagine that there's anybody they would name and you go, oh, wow, that's too bad. Right? To me, that's evidence that you have relationship conflict because you have just the name of that person, you're already feeling that negativity about, oh, wow. That's too bad. I was so excited, and now I'm way less excited. So we all have it. 
and I'm going to show you kind of how we get there. But we really like to try to avoid it. All right, so that's the source. It can be about these personal features, and particularly because most of us work here for more than six months, a lot of this is a prior experience. So Ryan and I did HLA together, and we had this experience, and we probably formed a relationship around that. That then informed, so you can see how it becomes this iterative cycle that can happen. All right, so that's where the sources start. And then we go through these responses. And so let me give you the responses. Forcing means I'm going to compel you to do it. And I can do that by threatening you or threatening your supervisor or threatening to withhold resources. But threatening is a common thing for me to do. I'm going to try to compel you. Remember, we talked about this power aspect of conflict. Smoothing we typically do with people that have more power than us in a lot of cases where we've kind of messed up. So this is where I'll like take responsibility. I'll say that was my mistake. You know, I said an idiotic thing. I should have never done that. Uh, we do it a lot of times with our significant others uh, because we do a lot of life with them. So early in my marriage, I had come home from being on call, and my wife said I made potato salad, and I got very excited because I love potato salad. And so she served the dish, but it was this marinated thing that I was completely different because my mother made mayonnaise-based potato salad, right? So I took one bite of this stuff, and I said, this is not potato salad, right? So so then I suddenly realized, you know, she was trying to, to do a nice thing. I really made a stupid comment. So two things happened. I immediately said, you know, that's ridiculous, and this is the best potato salad ever. And then I had to eat this wrong kind of potato salad for a decade, right? And so like I said, I really like the other kind. But that's an example where I'm engaged in smoothing language, where I've taken responsibility or make a joke at my own expense. Avoidance sounds like a thing you should do, right? Avoid conflict. But avoidance is actually a very aggressive response to disagreement where I'm going to withdraw from like being involved. And you can watch this in your team. Like someone says, hey, I have a great idea. Let's do this. And someone else says, that's just the dumbest thing I ever heard. And then that person gets really quiet. Many times they'll cross their arms. They'll lean back. They quit you know, contributing ideas. When it comes time to divvy up the task, they won't divvy up the task. They just become like dead weight in the group. So that's actually avoidance. It's actually a very aggressive uh, response. <coughs> Compromise is what most of us think we have to do, uh, and we do it like when we negotiate for cars, um, that kind of thing. And so we, I'm going to give up something, you're going to give up something. And a lot of conflict researchers won't even include it in their models because they argue it's so complicated that it's difficult to study it. And furthermore, it usually represents kind of a mixture of these other elements. But it is something where I'm going to give up a thing and you're going to give up a thing so we can come to an agreement. And then problem solving is the one that's very different because um, problem solving means I'm going to try to work with you to solve a problem over here. Most people think of conflict as being a thing between me and you. Problem solving is saying, no, let's work together to solve the problem. Okay, so it's, a, it's like a very different way to even think about it. And this is why it's important, right, because we can then go back in our two lens model and we can say, okay, we started with sources that were task and relationship. We've sequenced through this dance, and now we come to outcomes, and you can relate it back to the two lenses. So problem solving is great because if I, you and I work together on a problem, I don't let it become something between us, then there's the possibility we'll come out of it at accomplishing what we want to in our task, and actually our relationship could be preserved and maybe even better. So it sounds like a magical condition that's quite unique. It's the so-called win-win outcome. That's where that language comes from. If I compel you, if I threaten, if I try to intimidate, if I try to use my big fancy titles to make you do stuff, I can probably convince you to do it in the short term, but forcing then has the consequence that it creates relationship conflict. Because most autonomous adult people, which all of you are, don't like being threatened to do something. They don't like to be coerced. And so I'll do it if you hold the power, but I will get you back like it's the godfather. You know, someday, someday you'll need a favor. 
and I'm not going to help you out. Compromise, as I mentioned, it kind of depends. So in, if you look at uh, in sales, there's both a condition of seller's and buyer's remorse. And this is if you've ever negotiated for a car, most people when they drive their shiny new car off the lot, within about a mile they're going, I probably overpaid. You know, I probably got ripped off. Like that special undercoating that they sold me at the last minute for $500, I probably got gypped on that. And that's a condition called seller's or buyer's remorse, and that's because you're revisiting and thinking you didn't do well. Smoothing, as I mentioned with the example with my wife, who's on the faculty here, a lovely person. Uh, she knows the potato salad story because she lived it with me. But that was all about preserving their relationship, right? I'm smoothing because I'm just hoping to fight for another day. And so that's why you do that with your boss, because you're hoping you don't get fired. And then avoidance, as I mentioned, has negative consequences because people resent it. There's a thing called economic free riding, and that's where I'm getting the benefit from the group, but I'm contributing nothing. And people identify that, and they resent it because it's unjust, right? Because all of a sudden, what are you doing in this project? You know, you're just freeloading on all of this. So just to give uh, uh, credence to the uh, real researchers in this area, there is a connection between the types, and so it's difficult sometimes to kind of manage them. And in fact, I'll make the case that they, they connect quite easily. And then not everybody agrees. Um, so in this conflict response sequences, they actually study like the best sequencing. So it's way more complicated than one response. It's actually a sequence of responses. And actually, there's interesting research about how you combine forcing and problem solving and smoothing. Like what's the proper sequence uh, to do it. So really interesting stuff, but it, it gets really complicated really quickly. But there's unanimity among conflict researchers that what you want to do is avoid anything that relates to relationship conflict because of the negative effect it has on it and because it's very difficult to rehabilitate. And Homer does not know this information, so he does all of it in terms of creating relationship conflict. So here are the processes, and this is really a key point. And some of them are kind of, uh, are kind of uh, obvious. So strong negative emotions. Um, they, you know, we're in the South. We're more like I think Asian culture. We tend to not be very open. Uh, we tend to be a little bit passive. Uh, so you do have to watch for these expressions. But many times, people like eye rolling and that kind of stuff are all examples of things that can be done. So like if you express a lot of anger or whatever. Forceful or harsh responses, not surprisingly, uh, having someone use profanity directed at you in a personal way is in most cultures not accepted uh, readily. Uh, there's very few that, that embrace that. Yes, thank you for implying that my mother is of the canine species. I embrace your, you know, attribution. So, The other one, which is a little bit more subtle and, not, and you hear a lot of, is called attribution or misattribution. And, the human species is designed that when we see a behavior, we automatically assign in our minds the worst possible motive for that behavior. Okay? So when I was recruited here, they didn't mention that the Jefferson County was at that time bankrupt, so they had these giant long lines for the auto tags. And so if you want to see a test if you're human, if you were in this long line, which used to take about two hours to get through, and someone cut in the front of the line, what was your, what was the crowd's response? Mm -hmm. Right, and, and what is your first, like, is same, if you get cut off rapidly in traffic, what is your initial reaction is that's a jerk, you know, or that's an idiot. It, and we're trained as scientists and as physicians, and in some cases some of y'all are physician scientists, we're trained to be disciplined to consider multiple alternatives, right? The process of making a diagnosis when you see a patient is to stay disciplined and let me consider other options. As a scientist, you would never look at a scientific outcome and say there's only one explanation, right? That would be poor. But that's what we do in life, right? So someone cuts us off and we don't ever say, perhaps they've had a mild neurologic event to account for their rapid, you know, turning in front of me. And I hope they recover. Perhaps I'll send them a car. You know, we don't ever have that thought. Same thing with the line. We don't ever say perhaps that person had an accommodation. As it turned out, you could bribe your way to the front of the line. That never occurred to me. They got a couple of people arrested about that. So, 
So this is what that is. The other part of attribution theory, which you, you listen for, it's just fun as a hobby, it's not really related to our topic, is people tend to attribute success to themselves and failure to their circumstances. And I hear this all day long from very senior people. Well, I'm doing this because of this. And so listen for it because you hear it. And so what I say to people is likely your circumstances have contributed to your difficulties, but what can you control in it? So that's always my challenge. All right, so let's talk about some keys to addressing it. So one thing is to understand your own tendencies. Y'all had a session a couple, three months ago about negotiation. I'll give you just a frame for it. To me, this is maybe the most powerful thing that you can learn. We have this new learning system. I don't know if there's like a thing in there. A great book around this is called Getting uh, to Yes. There's Getting to Yes, there's Getting Beyond No, which is my favorite. And there's a new one called Getting to a Positive No, which is how to tell people who have power over you, no, I'd rather not do that, right? So they're both kind of interesting books. And then I took a course in it, which was has been extremely helpful in my life. Learn to listen strategically, manage your language and emotions, suspend attribution, which we've talked about. And I'm going to give you the anatomy of an apology because, as it turns out, this is something none of us learned in any of our training. So this is a little program for about 12 bucks. You can understand your complex tendencies. And what's interesting about these people is they'll, they'll go in and say, At, you're in a fairly calm situation, and what, what are your tendencies? And you'll do a fairly short survey, and it'll tell you among the five responses, what is your tendency? And then it will say, imagine a situation where the disagreement is quite sharp, and it'll have you imagine that and repeat it again. So I know what I do and that I tend to get more aggressive, more forceful. But my, and my contention would be under the influence of epinephrine, probably we either become more aggressive or more likely to become avoidant. And so I would just think under pressure. And my test for that is if you come up and really activate me, it's hard for me to stay in the mode of, well, let's see if we can work this out. It's hard for me to stay in a problem-solving mode. But if you want to know what your tendency is, you can take this inventory. I think that's a really helpful first step uh, in self-awareness. And this is kind of negotiation, and we don't have, I, we could do a whole session on this, but the most powerful part of this to me is most of us know when we're, go, when we're involved in a conflict what our own interests are, where at least I didn't do a very good job is contemplating the interests of the other party. So that's one thing is really seriously contemplate the interests of the other people. And to take a problem-solving approach, you've got to be seriously committed to trying to help them achieve their goals while you're achieving yours. That's what problem-solving looks like. And that takes work because we're naturally selfish, so we're naturally thinking about our own ideas. So the other big thing is to understand the difference between a position and an interest. And the interest is your ultimate goal. A position is just one way to get there. And what happens is, because you're smart people and you're problem solving, you generate a position, but you don't think about it as only one option. And so you fall in love with your position where you need to stay focused on your interests. So I did a car, I did to do a car transaction. And so I, in my mind, this is what the value of my trade-in is, and this is how much dollars I'm prepared to spend. And so I had that in my mind as my ultimate interest. And I went into the car salesman and, and he gave me much less for my trade-in, but he discounted the new car substantially, so it was the same. So that's an example. I didn't care. How, I didn't care that how he put it together was how, different, how I had imagined it. It accomplished my goal. So I said, thank you very much. And I took the car and we concluded the deal. But I think many times we don't think enough about what's the difference and are there alternative ways to solve this problem. And that's where having flexibility of your thinking is really important in a problem-solving approach. I don't know, you all seem like a thoughtful group, but the surgeons, we don't do this well at all. And so in our research, we went to five different academic centers and we talked to nurses and surgeons and asked them about effective conflict management strategies in the operating room. And not one single person in five different centers mentioned, yeah, one time the surgeon listened to me, right? So this is a thing. If you're a surgeon and you can stop and listen, man, you're in the top 1% of the population. But listening is really important to understand the other person's interests and their positions. And I think a lot of times we rush because we're in a rush to exp espouse our own ideas. So this is actually 
pretty powerful stuff to learn to stop and listen. If you're naturally introverted, you have a bit of an advantage because you don't have the same need to, to express whatever, and so it's an advantage. This is some language to use that I think is always a legitimate language. If someone is doing uh, what they call harsh tactics towards you, one of the, the pieces of advice is just to say that, you know, I sense that you're threatening me. And, the, and the, many times you can just say that, you know, I feel like that you're, I feel threatened when you do this because of this. And so that's language. No one can ever delegitimize what you're feeling. They can say, oh, that's not my intention. That's fine. Good to know that you didn't mean to cause me harm, but I'm just telling you what I'm feeling. No one can ever debate what you're feeling. And then this one, just to give you a sense it's a real social science thing, is this idea of staying suspended. So what I do when someone cuts me off into traffic is I'm still human. I still have adrenal glands, so they still pump out the same epinephrine. But I say I'm not going to reach a conclusion. I see what Ryan's doing here, but... I don't, I'm going to say I don't know why, and maybe there are multiple plausible reasons. So I'm going to stay suspended that I don't really understand why you're doing the things you're doing. And I just try to stay in that kind of neutral state. Hard to do in the tagline. So in thinking about your group, uh, I try to think about like how as sort of people with a scientific mind, how do you think about preparing for a potentially conflict-laden experience. So the things I've given you now are, are really about tools about managing conflict kind of chronically. But let's talk a little bit about, like you're going to go into a meeting or you're going to go to an event, and how do you prepare to manage conflict, particularly if you might be leading that. So my thought was, is when you're setting up an experiment, you just don't wander into your lab and say, hey, let's just throw something together today, right? So there are phases in experimentation, and if you'll adapt the same discipline to conflictual circumstances, I think you can maybe be more successful. But a lot of it's about adapting the same discipline you would use in planning experimentation that you do for these kind of meetings. And again, I'm trying to give you a huge advantage because I see very senior scientists who are very disciplined around their scientists and not disciplined at all in this other stuff, right? So it seems to be that in an experiment, you do a planning, you actually execute the experiment, and then once you have your results, you kind of reflect, analyze, and recover a little bit. I'm going to suggest that you can use the same phases for planning for a conflictual event. So to do pre-conflict planning, you need to think about it, and occasionally young people get ambushed because they don't even think about, I didn't even think conflict would happen. So you need to anticipate it every day, Every day in your professional lives, you need to be working on creating trust. And the reason is the literature shows that the existence of trust between parties makes it less likely for task-related conflict to become relationship conflict. And I'll show you why in a minute. And then one thing particularly young people don't understand is, and I kind of feel sorry for y'all when y'all drop into my world, like with the executive committee, because none of the real stuff in that meeting happens in the meeting. Right? It happens before the meeting and after the meeting. So you have to get smart about understanding what really goes on in a meeting. And it's not nearly what it appears to be. That took me a while to learn. <laughs> so this is how you might anticipate conflict. So again, my background is in medical education. This is an interesting thing. There's a good reason for the old saying, it's easier to move a graveyard than change a curriculum. For changing a curriculum is a highly political process. So. Moving a graveyard would be tricky because it has symbolic, emotional uh, importance to people. Uh, we all get riled up in Alabama every time it's about Confederate War monuments because that taps into a lot of emotionality. Uh, and so, so that's part of you. Think about the original definition of conflict. You can, by holding that definition, you can say, huh, it looks like to me there may be resources in play here. We're going to talk about money in this meeting. We're going to talk about space in this meeting. Therefore, I'm going to prepare for conflict to occur because it will. And the curriculum, I've been in a couple of these things, they're very nasty. And they start out completely rational and then they get very political and very ugly very quickly. Because it's like, well, I have the longest clerkship. Well, I, and it's about like my value to the institution. And it's just stupid. But it happens. And, and, and you're ill advised not to account for it. 
So anticipated anytime values are different, um, like I got in trouble at the executive because I started talking about tenure and I made the comment at UAB it doesn't seem like tenure is all that valuable because it doesn't protect your salary, it doesn't protect your space, uh, it makes it hard to fire you so I'll give you that because it takes a big deal. But really you can still, they can make your life so miserable, who would want to stay? And several of the senior faculty, I presume with tenure, objected very strongly to my characterization. So I got beaten from my head to my toe. And I don't say that anymore. I still think it, I just don't say it. So, so this is how you gain trust with people, and that's about being capable. Uh, that's about beneficence means to I mean to do you well and that kind of makes sense because if I'm obviously out to get you even if I'm capable you don't trust me because you know I'm out to get you and then integrity and so these are important things to demonstrate and integrity I really think it's important to keep your word you know that if you promise to do a thing do it and be careful with your promises in fact there's a whole book about behavioral integrity it says be careful with your promises. Make note of those things because um, if you break them, even if you break them for really good reasons, uh, it's a problem. This idea of creating a guiding coalition, you can see here in a diplomatic thing, they really understand this and we really don't. And so that involves in a conflict meeting, if you have particularly people senior, you are going to be there, I would get to them before the meeting and say, hey, I'm thinking about this, what are you thinking? Everyone likes to be asked. And then you've kind of put them on notice, I'm going to kind of bring this up. And if they support you in it, it's even better. Because a really powerful person speaks out in support of your idea, then a lot of the other stuff goes, goes away. What they don't like is to get ambushed in meetings, and they'll really activate them. So for a lot of really good reasons, it's important to go and kind of have these conversations before the meetings. So in the execution phase, there's really an art to running this kind of meeting. And some of it is, particularly if you're young in your career, pay attention. And when you hear people start really sharply disagreeing, watch the person that, run, that runs the meeting and try to pick up little things that they do that help to kind of manage all that. So you have to analyze it, and I've given you the two frames. So what I would say when you're sitting there, and it's hard to do when you're conducting the meeting, but I'm thinking, what's going on here? Is this task-related conflict or is this relationship conflict? And are behaviors being exhibited that's causing that transformation? So as this senior professor just got up and called this senior pr professor an idiot and insulted his entire contribution to science. Okay, well now I'm hearing that. It's time. i got to kind of do something here. Uh, and then negotiate, and we've talked a little bit about some of this. And what I can tell you about that is what happens when you're running a, an event, even if it's your lab team, your what you can try to do, but it's really challenging to do, is what's called a multi-party negotiation. And that is you're trying to listen to everybody's interests and come up with a solution that satisfies every, everybody. It's not mediation. It's really trying to do multiple negotiations at the same time. Very difficult to do. And at some point, you may have to just say, look, we just got to have a timeout and kind of reset. And then manage the tension is sometimes you do have to make hard choices and you do have to say, I'm just going to have to make a decision. One of the things I think works well in these events is to get everybody's input and then say, okay, I need to make a decision. In some cases, you can make it then. In some cases, you say, I want to think about it, and I'll get back to you. But you can't, like, one of the things that I like from the business world is called the Pareto Principle. So the Pareto Principle is the 80-20 rule. Are you all familiar with this? So 20% of the people do 80% of the work, 20% of the people drink 80% of the beer, et cetera, et cetera. So you're never going to make everybody happy, right? But what I find is if you listen to people, if you afford them the respect of letting them express their opinions, and as long as you're not making the same person aggravated every time, then basically people understand you have to make decisions. There's only so much resources to make. And then after you think, what I would say, if you're young in your career and doing this, set up someone and say, I'm going to be managing this meeting or this event or this lab meeting, and I'm working on this, I want you to study what I'm doing and give me feedback at the end. Like, I, Brian and I have a relationship, I trust him, and I might set him up as my confederate, and afterwards, he's going to have to give me real feedback and say, yeah, you kind of cut this person off or whatever. I, I uh, had a reputation nationally that I would get like agitated and my, you know, uh, I would say things that would actually shut the room down, like the group would just quit talking. 
because they were so fearful of like what I was going to do to their ideas. And so I thought about that and I said, well, that's good to know that I have that in my armamentarium, my toolkit, but I don't really want to have that reputation because I do need people to express their ideas. Uh, and so I would add, and they said, oh, you do this thing where you kind of cross your arms or you'll do this and we know you're getting agitated and we know somebody's getting ready to have their soul crushed. And so I would say to someone like Ryan, watch me because I start doing this thing. Or maybe you're an avoider. And you start saying, I get really nervous, and I start talking and doing these things. And someone will say, yeah, you need to just put your hands on the table and be calm and deliberative, you know, and that kind of thing. So, And we all need it. Uh, so, And then, as I mentioned, feedback from people you trust, and then apologize. So this is the other big thing. This is how to apologize. And I was just talking to my sister recently who had made my mother mad. I had to coach her back through what an apology looks like. Acknowledge your actions, and this is really important, without excuse or explanation, right? So, um, you know, Ryan, I see that when I did this, uh, that that caused you to be upset. Uh, and I promise, you know, I didn't mean to be disrespectful, and I promise I won't do that again. So it's not saying I did that because what I like it is when people turn it around, they try to make it about what I did, right? So then if he's, if I say, well, Ryan, I'm sorry I got upset with you, but you know, what you said was so ridiculous. I didn't want the whole group to even hear it. So that's why, I, okay, now I put it back on them. You just have to own it and say, I got to try to do better. So that's really my kind of framework, how I think about it. Um, it's really important because the work that you're doing, uh, whether it's in patient care and science, is really important. You will be doing it in teams more and more. That clearly is the direction the NIH is headed. That's the expectation. I think that's just an acknowledgement that the, the problems that everybody's trying to solve with their scientific inquiry requires teams. So the, the day of the splendid single scientist that has to break through the thing, I think, is gone pretty well. So it's a really important thing on how we all work, and that's kind of my thinking, which continues to be an evolution. But I'm happy to hear your ideas or if you have comments or particular scenarios, and I'm happy to try to help you with those as well. The one thing, I mean, I've heard this talk before through the HLA, and one thing that really st stuck with me was the one that you're talking about when you would be in meetings, and you'd have someone watch you to be able to get feedback later, because again, all of us have all these non-verbals that we don't even realize we're giving off, right. that may be interpreted correctly or maybe not, right. and I think for you all <laughs> with early career investigators, it's something to be thinking about as you build met teams that you... Uh, uh, mentees to your point of shutting things down to make sure that you are presenting yourself as being open to uh, feedback from your mentees as well. Um, so figuring out who you can rely on to do that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot to, but yeah, you know, I mean, I had a resident one time, I had given her her end of perform, her end of rotation evaluation. She said, now I'd like to give you some feedback. And I just laughed because that just doesn't happen. And then I said, well, yeah. And so she gave me some valuable input. So to me, if people give you feedback, first of all, you have to seek it from most people. So I would try to set it up. And about a meeting, I would say, you know, I would I would go to people and say, how do I, how do, I do? Like, I'm not very expressive. And I have an emergent genetics profile that proves it. And the problem with that is that it can look stern or even angry. And so... Sometimes I am angry, but not all the time. And uh, so I asked an executive coach, I said, what do I do about that? And he said, well, I'm the same way. And so I'll look up in the rearview mirror when I'm driving and I'll see I've taken on this very serious expression. And so then I, for the next few miles, I just smile at myself broadly in the rearview mirror. And my thought, as he was saying, which I, I did not express verbally, is that's just the dumbest thing I ever heard. So. What I do when I'm in meetings and I'll look around and everybody's looking kind of very grumpy and serious is I think about this guy doing this stupid thing. And what I find is it does cause you to relax. You know, you're not like, oh, that's great. Uh, but you're at least you take on a more kind of a neutral facial expression of like, I'm not here getting ready to you know, wipe you people out. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, there are little things that you don't even think about uh, clues.
Yes, please. Um, this is very helpful. Good. Thank you. I don't know if you feel comfortable sharing your slides with the group, but I would love to share them with people I work with if you're comfortable. And then also thinking about teams who are trying to work through conflict, who um, maybe are looking for resources as mediator, that kind of thing. Have you been asked to comment on that or resources yes. within the institution you would recommend? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, they do a little bit of that in the clinical enterprise, um, but it's really kind of a starting thing. So there is a new ombudsman uh, that UAB has developed, and this is more of a, it's, it's set up in different ways in different institutions. My sense, and this person has training in conflict mediation, so that would be a resource to go to them individually and say, and I'm trying to work through this and see. In terms of someone to come sit with the group, you know, that's, I don't know of any resources like immediately offhand. So you may have to kind of lead that. And to me, some of that is about setting what's called the climate in the room. And the best thing I can say is you have to role model these behaviors. You know, you have to be aware of them. That might be a person, if you know someone who's senior to you that really manages it this well, invite them to come sit in, you know, with your group and kind of give guidance to the group and that sort of thing. Uh, it's really hard once relationship conflict has occurred uh, because even if people will acknowledge it, it's, it's hard to unwind it um, because it just tends to be what rolls around your head. I'm happy to share the slides. I'll send you a PDF version of it, not because I don't trust you, but because I use copyrighted materials. And uh, So just email me at darogers at uab.edu, and I'm happy to share this presentation with you. To your quick, one of the potential resources might be Anthony Hood yeah. over in the School of Business who does a lot of work with team science, uh, has done some research in this area. If he had not had he may have some suggestions yeah. or some different things to think about. Yeah, certainly some of us in the dean's office, you know, sometimes you just need like a referee right. come in and sit in a room and then just and go through some of this and say because in some cases when trust is lost, like I don't to me once trust is breached. I think you're to the point of making tough decisions and personnel may have to change. Uh, because if you consistently, like, not met deadlines with me, not done these things, then I can, as a leader, I'm going to put you on notice. And then I'm going to ultimately say, I can't, you know, I can't work. You know, I can't have you a bit more of my team. So, which is a hard thing. Yeah, I'm in a situation where it's two senior people. Yeah. So I'm the junior person, right. so I was thinking of like how how can I carefully craft an email and you know encourage yeah. slides that you know were yeah. really helpful. Um, yeah. So. Well, I think the language of um, so I would read like getting to yes and just think about that a little bit. Uh, but I think when you're trying to manage up is a treacherous That's, little yeah. business. Yeah. yeah. But I think what you can always say is the language of you know I've been a member of your team or whatever. And this is what I've observed, and it really kind of makes me uncomfortable. Because as a junior person, I respect both of you, and when y'all are battling it out, and when, particularly when it becomes personal, it really makes me uncomfortable. You know, so I think you can always just be that honest. To put them on notice that I'm noticing, you know, that these things are happening, and it bothers me professionally. Thank you. But you can't, you know. So. I mean, do you have any suggestions for um, managing conflict between people who you're supervising? Yeah. So when it's not, when you're not the bad guy, it's kind of my approach to this is climb under the desk and let people just throw things at each other. Right. <laughs> and that actually didn't work out as well. Yeah. Doesn't sometimes. Yeah. I think, you know, I think with this information that we've talked about today, what you can say is, look, there seems to be this relationship conflict. You know, I've learned about this state of relationship conflict. And what I've learned is when it exists, it substantially disadvantages the team. And so I've noticed, you know, it's been my sense from comments you've made that this may exist between you and X. And then just let, sometimes people will say, oh my gosh, that's not true at all. That's just kind of, that was not my intention. Again, it's put, putting people on notice, I'm noticing, that I'm noticing these things are happening. So then I would start by putting both people on notice to say there seems to be a problem. Am I interpreting this correctly or misinterpreting? As a leader, then I think the next step is to hold them accountable to say, it's my expectation that we all work together professionally. 
you know, whether y'all love each other outside of work or what, and we're, I mean, to some degree, we're all like in these little small submarines. You know, you've got people in a close confined space. There's going to be conflict that occurs. So I think you can acknowledge that conflict does exist. You can say that it, um, I'm noticing it. I wouldn't do it with the first meeting, but then I might ultimately say, I see that this situation persists. And as the leader, I'm ultimately responsible for the function of the team. I would hate to be put in the circumstance where I have to choose for one person to leave. Right, so that's the escalation of saying, you know, this is not, we're not going to be able to work together anymore. So, you know, again, it's, it's kind of just, I've noticed this is acceptable and these are going to be consequences. So. But again, I mean, the grace you can extend to everybody is, this is the recipe, smart, passionate people, under-resourced. And so all the people that I've worked with that have been in the dean role, whether the, have been amazed at how much of their life is just people asking for money to do things. Because you got a lot of smart people with a great passion to try to solve a problem and they don't have any resources. So. But. Well, I know it's after six, um, but I welcome we, uh, food left to people on the other end. So what, what exactly is, are we moving? So we've been kind of on hold for two years, waiting. So we're kind of excited to well, take the next step. The only thing I worry about offering it to new classes is that I hear some of it's, you know, kind of, uh, uh, prestige would be the wrong word, but if it just becomes anybody who signs up and getting any start. But, you know, there's so many people with UAB medicine that's hard to go back are satisfied with me. I'm sorry, actually, maybe what I did say yesterday, they do a few bucks in each class, and it's like, look, you're about to pay them. Yeah, what's the thing? Yeah, we could always, if you're counting, if we had an absolutely good deal, we could do some foundation thing. Do I think the other thing? I don't know what they do. I know how big it is. I'm a little unknown. But they're doing things. It sounds like that. Right. Well, that's what GNM is ultimately tasked to do, is to figure out what's the what sort of, should we build a progressive model. Um, so we'll talk about that some Thursday, uh, tomorrow in terms of say, uh, for example, is there like is there a next thing that we could, that we could all talk about? We've got a couple pretty good ideas. Good. Yeah. Did you let that explain? I think so. It's good to see you. Um, I actually have a question for the board. Clinically, you can also talk. Yeah, sure. Okay. Good to see you. What, what is your training? Uh, uh, I'm going to be training really quick. I'm going to be training to be a part of the training. I'm going to be training to be a part of the training. I'm going to be training to be a part of the training. It sounds like my name is Dr. Goldie. Yeah. 
Let's turn the 